Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Richard French and Damya Swami with us today. Hello, Damya. Hi, Francis. How are you today? I am doing awesome on this November 21st, a few days before American Thanksgiving, as we do this one. So I'm doing quite well. And I'm in Phoenix, and it's warm in the day, cool in the morning. It's lovely. And Damia, where are you located at? Uh, I'm not far from Paris, where it's very cloudy. It's gray. It's raining. And it's not that warm. <laughs> it's still lovely. But it's still I, lovely. Well, I'll, inv I'll invite you out to Phoenix. So you can come on out, and you can get a little sunshine. For I love that. I love All that. right. You got an open invite. And Richard, where are you located at? I'm uh, in the frosty area outside of Boston. Okay. Uh, looking forward to our first snow of the season in a few days. Yeah, I was going to ask if it had dropped yet. So very cool. Very good. Very nice. Uh, boy, that is an awesome bookshelf behind you there, Richard. That is wild. Look at all this. That's great. Very cool. And Tommy, you got a dart. You got a dart background. Yeah. Uh, I'm a member of the DART investigation team. I was oh, involved okay. in there. It's okay. an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a wild one. We've done a couple of videos on those DART missions, so it's very good. Uh, and we'll start with you, Tamia. What do you like to do for research? Uh, well, I actually do have multiple hats. Mm -hmm. One with observation, the other one with just summarizing two two. One with observation, the other one with theory. But my main focus, I'm joining the both of them to study solar system objects, going from the small solar system objects, the most primitive one, to giant planets and ring systems around them. Very cool, so, very yeah. cool. The proverbial double threat, you do both observation and theory. Ooh, that's right. Very <laughs> soon, soon you will be a triple threat and you'll start uh, designing instruments and then you'll be an yeah. instrument builder too, so. <laughs> that, would be, that would be fun. That would be fun. And Richard, what do you like to do for research? I'm a planetary astronomer. I just retired from 40 something years of teaching astronomy at Wellesley College. Okay. Uh, but retirement does not mean I've stopped doing research. And in fact, yes. uh, it's giving me the freedom to continue with both funded and unfunded research. The paper we're talking about today is really a, a public service paper that wasn't funded, but uh, from long years of experience of studying the planets with occultations, uh, I realized that we really re needed to know what the upcoming occultation observations were going to be. And that was the motivation for this project. Awesome. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome PSJ article, Planetary Science Journal. It is open access. It's the open access era, people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. <laughs> Earth-based stellar occultation predictions for Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Titan, and Triton, 2023 to 2050. And Richard and Damia, take us away. Well, I thought I'd start briefly by commenting about the long time horizon that you see for this series of predictions. And this was motivated in part by um, wanting, to do, wanting to know what the next Uranus ring occultations would be. They've last been observed in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk in a few minutes about why there's such a long gap in observations. Um, but I realized that uh, if you're going to the effort of making these predictions, it's good to have a long time horizon so that you can plan for space missions to the outer planets, which have long time horizons, and mm -hmm. observing proposals, um, and other proposals that have five-year time horizons. And as we'll see, the... Uh, the predictions for these objects are spotty and very irregular over the course of these decades. Okay. And, uh, maybe, Damia, you could talk a little bit about why we chose these targets. Yes, sure. So in 2017, there was an occultation by Triton, which was amazing. It was a transatlantic event. Over 100 people recorded the data from both sides of the Atlantic. It was amazing. Cool. Then I thought, you know what? Since I started science, I've always heard Neptune is receding from the galactic plane. It's moving in a field that's depleted of stars. Okay. Therefore, mm -hmm. we can no longer have occultations. So the last ones that were recorded were actually in 1990. I thought, we have an occultation by Triton. 
And we have this amazing thing nowadays called the Gaia catalogs that yes. people did not have back in the days. So mm. let's just go and see if there are occupations by Neptune. And that's how, yeah, the Gaia catalogs. And, and I'm actually part of the Gaia uh, consortium, the DPAC. Yeah. So the, the thing is that in 2021, there was the first event which I attempted an occupation by Neptune. It was amazing. Okay. We got we got time on all the big telescopes on Earth in the yeah. Americas, North, Central, South, and even Hawaii. Okay. And then from there, I thought, okay, that's first victory. Now let's make it a pattern <laughs> and go for the others. Very good, very good. A succession of victories, we will call it. <laughs> yep. Very good. And there well, was one actually. Another part of the motivation, I mean, uh, I was part of the Cassini team for for its entire mission, and one might well ask, why bother observing Saturn? Don't we already know everything about Saturn? Um, and for each of these objects, Earth-based occultations give access to parts of the atmosphere that can change over yes. time, so it gives you seasonal information. Yes. Uh, certainly for the rings, which are detectable around Neptune, Uranus, um, possibly Saturn. Uh, again, we have an opportunity to uh, look for time variability. And um, when we have a chance to talk about Uranus in a few minutes, we'll see that the rings are providing a lot of valuable information about not only the ring system, but also the interiors of planets. Right. Uh, so it'll be great uh, opportunity to learn in we, as we anticipate the um, Uranus flagship mission. Finally, let me just comment. We chose two of the largest moons. Um, Adamia mentioned uh, Triton, which of course is interesting because it's like Pluto, but not necessarily like Pluto. Right. Uh, it has a tenuous atmosphere and it would be good to know more about it. And Titan is the target of the Dragonfly mission. Right. So certainly anything we can learn about uh, Titan's atmosphere with the approach of that mission also seems like it's a, a good thing. So all of those were motivations for having a long time horizon and choosing these particular targets. And as, as Damia alluded, the Gaia catalog offers such precise positions mm -hmm. that we now can make confident predictions out to the time of 2050, even for Titan and Triton. Maybe not for their exact location on the Earth, but at least to identify which occultations might be worth looking at in more detail as the time approaches. Very nice. Cool. I just want to add something about the long-term variability. So sure. I was mentioning the case of Neptune earlier. So we've seen from, from adaptive optics imaging over the years and even Hubble Space Telescope data that the rings and the arcs, so an incomplete ring structure around Neptune is actually varying with time. Yeah. So and and these rings, these arcs were actually detected by occultation in 1984. Therefore, mm -hmm. if they are variable and if we can have another occultation, series of occultation by these arcs, we can learn more about the how they vary over time. Cool. Similarly, Dick was mentioning um, the atmospheres. It's been 40 years since the first occultations on Neptune, meaning. It's been one season on Neptune. So uh, uh, one yeah. season on Neptune is equivalent to about 40, 41 Earth years. Mm -hmm. So we can go and detect all those seasonal changes. Maybe a good place for us to, to, to dive into the paper okay. would be just to look at figure one. Let's go to figure one. We've got so we'll be, you'll be skipping over a lot of uh, tables and figures and uh, detail about the occultations. But for those of you who might be uh, interested, you might be working at an observatory and want to know in the next five years, is there anything good to observe from Hawaii yeah. or uh, Bangladesh uh, that uh, I can put in for my five-year observing plan? Our predictions enable you to know what the events are, what their quality is, what the observing circumstances are. Um, and give you an opportunity to make a list of potential targets and to see whether they're something that would be of interest to you. Yes. Uh, so 
uh, we begin just by just trying to illustrate a global view. Here's an occultation, an example of an occultation um, by Uranus and the rings. And the top figure is if you were on Uranus and looking at the Earth at the midpoint of the occultation, Okay. This shows you that the best place to observe this would be from Kavalur, India. So those of you who are watching from India, you can uh, get ready for 2028, December 29th, and you're in the ideal spot. Cool. Uh, the S South African Observatory is yeah. uh, just yeah. barely on the edge. And uh, Peak de Midi, where, where Damia is near, up in the upper left, yes. uh, as the Earth rotates uh, over the course of the occultation, um, the occultation will be visible. And so this gives you a quick view of whether you're in the right hemisphere to observe this event. Um, and then if you look in the bottom part of the figure, Excellent. Okay. It, it shows you the earth view and what the occultation tracks are from each of the stations. Ah, and okay. so mm -hmm. you can see if you look at the... Uh, Peak to Midi, red one, mm -hmm. you can see that uh, the observations begin just before you cross the rings on yeah. the right -hand side. That's what the, the round dot is. So if you move your cursor to the right side of that red. It starts here. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So that's when it's high enough above the horizon and the sun is low enough to make good observations. So you'd be able to capture the rings, just barely graze the planet on the way. Mm -hmm. And then on the way out, capture the rings again. Nice. So each of these, uh, and then if you look at the lower right, you can see that uh, that dark dark, dark brown uh -huh. uh, and Anglo-Australian telescope are not the places to be because it will have set by the before the ring before uh, the observations begin. Right. So this is this is a qualitative view that lets you see quickly. Uh, we've chosen a set of six or seven sites that are strategically uh, located at different longitudes and latitudes around the Earth that are representative. So you can interpolate between those to see whether you happen to be at a site that is good. Uh, so uh, part of the effort has been not only to say, yes, there's an occultation, but to enable people to say, is this good for me from where I can observe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why don't we move to... Um, figure five. Five, five and Damia, why don't you talk a little bit about um, yes. the variability of the frequency of occultations <laughs> over time? Let's get to figure okay. five. Oh, lovely. There. Okay, sky maps. Yeah. Well, as you can as you can see, all of you, there are lots of tables, lots of figures. So we're, we're not going to go through all of them because that would be way too long. So this figure, you can see four sub figures here. So there are maps of the sky. Um, okay. Showing how the path of the the four giant planets, how we see them from from Earth. Okay. And yep. basically, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Let's go to one of them. Let's go to Uranus, since we were talking about Uranus earlier. A sure. figure one. Yeah. So here. So basically, what what you have is the path of the planet here in the black line, the wave line. Yes. And 1975, that's basically when occultations began. Okay. Occultation campaigns began around this planet. And here, each dot along this line shows an event, a successful event in the past, where data was recorded. Cool. And you can see that in the 70s, in the 80s, there were quite a few. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, then there is at the... At the far left of the figure, there is the 2006 that event that uh, Dick was just mentioning now. And what you see that band, which is very bright, is actually the Milky Way. So mm -hmm. basically, you have a lot more event when the path of the planet crosses the Milky Way, which makes, makes sense. More stars. So what we see now, if we go to the other side of the figure to the right, is that starting in the 2030s, will cross again the galactic plane. So we should expect here a lot more ah, here we event. Go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'm with basically, you. Are you okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm with you. So, and this obviously goes until 2050, because that's where we, we went. 
but basically in the 2030s there would be lots of events yeah and and we were mentioning earlier the uranus orbiter and probe mission which is in uh-huh. preparation if it launches hopefully it will launch successful it will be successful nasa isa collaboration just like cassini hugens mission yes it will be in the 2030s basically what tells us what this tells us is that we can do a lot in the 2030s from earth to prepare for that mission yes and if you go to figure six let's go to figure six okay we got each of those for each of those planets very good it's basically another way to present this same figure oh nice nice Okay, let's do a global. Well, why don't you let me? Why don't I take over Please, here for ahead. a moment and go talk ahead. about Uranus, sure. and then uh, you can go back and contextualize it for the other planets. Voyager. So, if you take a look at the middle panel, okay. you can see that the, what's being plotted here is the ring opening angle. So, uh, Uranus, in when the rings were discovered in 1977. Mm-hmm. The ring opening angle was quite substantial. It's because the pole is tipped. You're looking almost like a bullseye. Uh-huh. And so in 19, when Voyager arrived in, in 1986, from Earth, the planet was almost completely open. Cool. So all of those uh, yeah, yeah. observations take advantage of the fact that the ring system was wide open. There right. were lots of stars, as Damia pointed out. And this was the golden era for high-speed infrared aperture photometers. Right. In a moment, Adamia will talk about the instrumentation required to observe each of these kinds of targets. Okay. But because Uranus is bright, um, almost all of the observations of the rings have been made in wavelengths where the atmosphere absorbs light in methane absorption bands. And those happen to be in the infrared in what's called the K-band at about two microns and at about 890 nanometers. And so that's part of the reason we're looking at the brightness of stars in K-magnitudes, because successful observations need to be made from large telescopes with infrared capabilities. So now as you move up this graph up to 2005 and 2006, you can see there are very few events. And Mm -hmm. Three Mm -hmm. things conspired to make that happen. Uh, One is there aren't many stars. That's the plan. Two is that the rings are almost closed down. So that means you're looking at the rings almost edge on. So the event happens extremely rapidly. Yes. So you need very high time resolution, Mm -hmm. capture the rings, and that is not provided by the kind of instrumentation that's available at most telescopes, where you need observations at a hundredth of a second or faster. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so all of those things, can, that's why if you look where today is, way here in 2023, it's a vast wasteland of events. But as Damia pointed out, when we get to the 2030s, those red dots tell you what the primo events are that are that are upcoming for Uranus. So I, it might be I, worth- I have a question. Uh, we got one dot that looks here about 2023. It's a red dot, it's a prediction. Are we oh, past- may I be? May I tell a sad story about that? Yes, please. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm here for you the story. I don't know if it's sad, but- Okay, it's well, sad. the, the it's original sad. motivation for this project came from my wanting to find out if there were any upcoming occultations uh, by Uranus of the rings. And it turned out, I said, I should do some predictions to find out. Mm-hmm. So I did a bunch of predictions and I found the best event between 2023 and the long time future happened just about a few months after I started the project. Oh boy. And so it was by far the best event, but it was too late to put in observing proposals for most for most places. And that is really, it got a bug in my ear of, I'm losing, we're losing out scientifically because people didn't know that this event yeah. happened. I, I, so for, fortunately, sure. I also went back in time and discovered that we didn't miss any others a few years earlier from oversights. But it yeah. turned out several people attempted to observe this, yes. it out everywhere, uh, that there was good instrumentation. But 
it was a lost opportunity. And so that was kind of the clarion call for somebody ought to make predictions and maybe that somebody should be me and us. And so Damia and I got in touch and I was really grateful for Damia's involvement because uh, she is going, she is such a, an intrepid observer uh, and has a lot of international contacts with observatories. So Damia, why don't you take over and talk a little bit about, maybe we move back to the figure five and you can go through when each of the other planets crosses the Milky Way and what the observing opportunities are for each of those. Okay. okay. Uh, I just want to say, if we could stay just Sorry. quickly on this figure, yes. I just want to say that this 2023 event was actually attempted from very few telescopes, okay. as, as uh, you were mentioning, Dick, but um, they were all clouded out, which oh. is even more frustrating. So there were attempts, people were out there, people tried. We got time on some telescopes, but yeah, clouds crashing the party. That's what you get. Yeah. No, I know. So I know. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> let's go back into figure five. Figure five, let's look at the Milky Way and Neptune, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you start with the Neptune story, Damia? Okay. Uh yeah, well, Neptune is kind of one of my of my favorite objects, so I can talk about it for hours, which is not the point here. So, Francis, please direct me or stop me if I'm too long. You're going great. So, Keep going. Okay. So the thing is, Neptune, as you can see from all these black dots, there were lots of campaigns in the 80s uh, yes. up to... 1990, and there was one Even in 2000. very unique campaign in the early 2000s, but that's it. It was only one detection from one telescope, which okay. did not give much, but still, it was good enough to, to give some information about the position of the planet. Yeah, please? Question? No. no? Okay. Um, so the point is that, as I said, Neptune was thought to be receding from the galactic plane. And you can see that because after the 1990s until 2025, yeah. there's no, I mean, it's moving. There are nearly no stars. Yeah. Yet there are, yet we do have events, just like the 2021 we recorded two years ago, or the 2023 October, which we attempted last month and which was clouded. And we were clouded out everywhere, Perfect. every single station on Earth. Um, which was actually attempting this uh, this event. So the point is that, as we were mentioning, the planets are very bright. And we are looking and we need to look in the infrared. We need yeah. to look in using filters um, that, are, that are characterized by strong methane absorption. Example, in the infrared, so we said the 2.2 micron, uh, the K-band are the 890 nanometers in the CH, CH4 or CH4 uh, filter in the opt optical. But the problem is that there are only very, very few instruments on Earth that ac can actually provide us with the time and accuracy and with the high cadence that we need. We can count them. I can, there are only very few of them. There, there are about less than five that can actually do the job. Okay. So about Neptune, as I said, the arcs have been evolving. We know that, we have imaged that. And also, if we compare our 2020s, 2021 and 20, and all the upcoming data to the data from the 80s, we'll be able to detect changes in the upper atmosphere. Yes. And all of this will actually be complementary to measurements that will be made by the James Webb. It's not redundant, it's rather complementary. So this is all very important. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to mention is that we're talking about Uranus Orbiter and Probe, and we, we had in the previous figure, some arrows showing the Voyager, if you go back to figure six. Yep, that's good. So showing the Voyager mission, yep. but one should, should know, so here you have Voyager 2, Voyager 2 at Neptune Voyager 2 at uh, Uranus in 1986 and 1989, respectively, for, for Uranus Neptune. 
if one has to keep in mind that it takes a long time to prepare for a mission, we might get, or should, should I say, we will get Uranus orbiter and probe go into Uranus hopefully in the 2030s, but it does not look like we will have something to Neptune anytime soon. Therefore, we should continue as much as we can grabbing and chasing every single opportunity, every single occultation that's observable from Earth and even from space, but we'll get to that later on, okay. in order to detect all these time variable phenomena, whether it's in the atmosphere on the, or in the dynamics of the rings. Good. So, yeah. Cool. Very nice. We could move to figure uh, 13, I think. 13. So, people, this is a really awesome paper. It's uh, 42 pages. It's got 15 figures, 20 tables, and two equations, and four rocking appendices that we will get to. Okay, so figure 13. Let's slide down to figure 13. One more. Awesome tables, K band magnitudes, and 13. So, as you saw from that scroll, uh, this paper includes only selected examples in the tables. Uh, all of the material is available as supplementary online material. In a few minutes, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that is and how that might be useful to you. But uh, so if you are a serious observer, you should not restrict your attention just to the paper long as it is. You should use the paper to give you a guide of the kind of um, high quality events that are coming up, but it could be that from your observing site, there are some that would be quite excellent that don't happen to be captured in the listed figures and tables. So right. really want, we wanted to make sure that the supplementary online material was available. It's now online as a link in the planetary NASA's planetary data system. Very cool. And you can download figures, tables, all of the information about any individual occultation and even from your own uh, representative observing site to see what the circumstances. You see an event in 2044 from the IRTF that looks good. You can download those figures and see uh, exactly what the circumstances are of that occultation. Right. So this figure is showing uh, Titan occultations. Um, Titan is, um, unlike the giant planets, which are so bright, uh, that require large telescopes, uh, because the satellites Titan and Triton are um, separated from their parent planet in most cases, um, you don't need to be worried about the scattered light from the giant planet uh, yes. in such a way. So you can use smaller telescopes. Yes. And um, the, as, as Damio was mentioning, the, the Triton occultation did not use just huge telescopes. It used array of small telescopes. So it may be that if you're looking uh, at one of these um, events, for example, in the upper right in 2031, mm -hmm. you can see, uh, we can just zoom in on that one in the upper right. Yep. Those dots are equally spaced in time. So that's telling you this is a very slow event, which means your signal to noise is going to be improved. Yep. The representative telescopes we include are the IRTF and Palomar and McDonald. But if you happen to be in the Northeast, uh, in Boston, for example, uh, on February 10th, you can set up an array of telescopes there and have a good chance to capture the, um, the atmospheric occultation. Or if you're in Puerto Rico and you have clear skies, you can perhaps observe what's called the central flash, which is when Ooh. the atmosphere this nearly spherical atmosphere refractively focuses the light cool. to the point directly behind. It's not a diffraction Arago spot. It's really the uh, refraction focusing. And cool. that can probe the very deep atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also you can see this event makes it over to Tenerife and uh, possibly to European stations as well. So um, tell, me, tell me a little bit what the uh, red and blue means here. Okay, the the red and blue the red lines are just telling you when are the north the blue lines are the north and south uh, limitations of the track on Earth, okay. and I've simply colored the red one so and it's off the Earth, and okay. the circle is the size of the shadow ah. of ah. the planet itself. 
Got it. Uh, the, the moon itself. Huh? And it's, um, of course, the ephemeris and the star positions may change a little bit, but for some of these Earth-based occultations, the Gaia predictions are so good that the uncertainties translate into only a few kilometers on the Earth for some events, wow. which enables observations and predictions for very small objects if you update the astrometry as well. Okay. So um, this is telling you this uh, kind of figure uh, gives you an overview of uh, what events might be. It tells you at the upper right that this is K-band, if you happen to be at a telescope. Yep. Um, a K magnitude of eight is pretty bright for a for an occultation, and a G or sort of a visual wavelength yep. uh, of around eleven still would give a quite acceptable return for trying to characterize this object. So, Dami, why don't you move on to the Triton figure? Yeah, but if I may add something here uh, yeah. on to, for the twenty thirty one event, I just want to say that given the magnitude which is very, I mean, this is very bright star, even in the visible. This is also an opportunity to include lots of citizen scientists across yes. the US, across Europe, as just as it was done for the Triton occultation of 2017. So let's now go to Triton. Okay, Triton. Next figure. Yep. Next figure. Let me, whoops, zoom out. Next figure, and G-Dog magnitudes Titan. Some glorious tables. And here we go. Triton, mid occultation. So as you can see, there are fewer events. Uh, but again, as, as we were saying, this is these are just highlights of some of the best events. And there and you can find lots of complementary information in the uh, supplementary online material. Mm -hmm. Let's zoom onto any anyone, any figure. I'll let you choose. Oh, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna pick one that looks like it's gonna take a cruise. So how about this one? Maybe okay, it's perfect. Time. You told yeah. me to pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Your choice is mine. Where are <clears> this one right here, That's 2043, K14. Okay, perfect. So <laughs> this one is going to be observable from the southern hemisphere, as you can see here. Uh, as we were mentioning, it's the same the same thing applies to Triton as for Titan, meaning that obviously the prediction could shift by a few kilometers south or north, whatever, but the point is that we know that it's going to be in this area of the globe. So we know where to be positioned. And guess what? There are here some big telescopes, hopefully in Chile, that could catch actually the, the occultation. And there are lots of amateurs in Brazil who might be able to participate to the event. Cool. And this is, however, this is out of reach of amateurs. Because if you look at the star in the visible um, or in Gaia magnitude, it's 17.25. So this is not going to be, a, this is yeah. not for, for small aperture telescopes. Rather, you will need a very big one. 14K magnitude is all, also feasible. But the other downside is that in this region of the world, we do not have, although there are some infrared telescopes, we do not have fast cameras installed yeah. on those telescopes. Therefore, this event of um, June 25th, 2043 is, an, unless, unless some, some big telescopes with big cameras are developed, it's most likely to... <laughs> not be a success okay since you're going to say fail i'm not i'm saying not be success so since you said uh citizen science here we want to get uh people involved so i picked one now you pick one where citizen sciences can play a, a good role uh let's go into well actually let's go into the one the upper one to the right 2029 yes, that one Let's get to 2029. There we go. Let's pop that up. There we go. OK. Uh, yeah. This one is, well, there are very few observers, not, not a lot, but there are some in North Africa, in Algeria, Morocco, can pick up this. 
Yeah. And there, there's also Tenerife and the, the Canary Islands. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And we could have possibly both infrared and visible data from this. But it's not going to be a large campaign like, like the 2017 one where we had over 100 people observe from uh, both Europe and, and the US. But mm -hmm. still, it is, it is achievable in both infrared and the visible. We just need to get telescopes there. We just need people to travel there eventually. But it is, at, and there are lots of amateurs actually in the Canary Islands who yes. can actually participate to this. Very cool. So could, if you zoom out, I just want to follow up with uh, you know, the point that this is virtually the complete set of Triton occultations mm -hmm. between now and 2050. It's a very rare opportunities yeah. and as we've explored in their conversation some of these are really challenging mm -hmm. so if you pair this list down to the ones that are um bright stars friendly over observatories it's really a relatively small number and so uh, the, to me that was a a disappointment in this large effort but it also brings up the point that you don't want to miss one because nobody predicted it right. so uh, it, it's telling you it's it's high scientific value. You want to take advantage of the opportunities that are good. And this contextualizes it and I think could motivate you to say, this is our best chance in five years. Let's go for it because um, they're pretty sparse. On the other hand, if you go back to figure uh, six again, sure. uh, five, I guess. Let's go back to five. Where am I? Three, four, five, five. Yeah. So now let's let's uh, take a look at uh, Saturn. Okay. Let's zoom in on Saturn a wee bit. There we go. So the orbital period of Saturn is about 30 years, and you can see that the 2020 and the 2050 sort of overlap each other. Yes. All the little extra wiggles are the parallax from the Earth as it wobbles back and forth on the black line. Yes. Uh, and yeah. you can see that... Uh, trying to find opportunities for Saturn in anticipation of the um, in between of the dragonfly mission be in the early 2030s is when they're going to be we won't be crossing the richest part of the Milky Way towards the galactic center is sort of the opposite side but nevertheless much more uh, many more events and in fact the um, the number is really so large, you, you might almost be able to observe Saturn itself on any given night. If we move over to Jupiter, just because we've left out Jupiter, I that. wanted to comment that even though Jupiter has rings, the rings are dusty. Um, the aspect of Jupiter is almost always nearly equator on, which is unfavorable for yeah. doing the tailed structure. Mm -hmm. I think it's very unlikely that anybody will be able to detect the dusty rings of Jupiter from Earth-based occultation, but I'd love to be wrong. Its orbital period is much shorter, and so you can see that there are multiple opportunities to cross the galactic center, and um, mm -hmm. Jupiter is just going to be uh, uh, rich with opportunities of very bright stars to look at its atmosphere. Nice. Should we move on and talk just a little bit about what's available to the in sure. the supplementary online online material? Sure, and I think that's down. That's in the appendices. Yeah, I've got a very nice uh, appendice figure here. This one, up, one up. Let's go. No, that was it. That was it. Okay. Yeah, was it. This one. Okay. So, yeah, why don't you take us through this and briefly, and okay. I'll I'll add comments too. So the thing about this complementary online material is that it comes it comes with maps like these ones. It comes with charts, but it also comes with a small script where you could say, okay, I'm looking, I'd like, I am in this region of the world, and I'd like to know what are the events that are observable from this region, from where I am, between this date and that date. And I want to limit, let's say you have given uh, limitation magnitude because you know your instrument and this is my limitation magnitude so it will you enter that you run your small python script and it will 
give you results like like these. So basically, what you have here, for example, for this uh, year in this 2028 event, so you have all the epoch, all the information, all the circumstances, the yes. magnitudes of the star, etc. You yeah. have that globe that we were mentioning in Figure One. Remember, yes. so the equivalent for this particular event, and also the um, the the view from the projected projected path of Earth onto Uranus and its range and its system, as we can see from the right, just like we saw on figure one. Yes. And in the table below, what you can see is the for the main sites that we mentioned earlier, the ones we have chosen mm -hmm. um, that are known to have telescopes that can actually observe these kinds of events. For example, the peak Jimmy D here is first. You have all the circumstances it's giving you latitude, longitude, um, whether it's going to be observed, what time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And you have little sky chart here just for you to identify the field. So Perfect. you have basically all the information to grab, use it to write your proposal, and point a telescope when you get the telescope time. Very cool. And so why don't we go on to the next outdoors. figure, and I'll take over. Let, let me ask one question here, and I just want to make this clear. So um, uh, is, is this a software that somebody will run for a particular location, event, et cetera, or is this interpolation in existing tables? So in other words, is this a live calculation, or are we processing um, past calculations? Okay, so... That's for the question. We, yeah. Go so ahead, go we, ahead. We've made a catalog of literally thousands of occultations. Each of them has this information. There's a there's a machine. I'm sorry. All good. There's a machine readable table uh -huh. that lists all of the occultations for each of the targets. Okay. And we have provided a simple Python script to illustrate how to access that and to answer the kind of question that Damia answered asked, which is okay. which of these events have G magnitudes brighter than some value right. that are visible from peak to me D between the following dates. I'm sorry. Um, and so it lets you um, interrogate. It's, it's a sample database program, but anybody who wants to do this in a more sophisticated way can obviously augment the program. We we emphasize. Okay. Uh, something very simple in terms of the search, uh, but part of the online material includes uh, an example of how to do those searches. So let's go down to the next figure. Okay, gotcha. Here we go. Uranus. Okay, so here's an example where we're looking at a specific site. Yeah. Um, and if we could zoom out a little bit. Yeah, sure. Oops, sorry, I didn't get it all. There we go. Let's do a full. Wow. Okay. There we go. Full page. <clears throat> okay. So now you're at peak to me D and it yeah. shows you a figure that we haven't talked about is maybe you can zoom in on that lower figure. This mm -hmm. is showing you the altitude of the target above the horizon as a function of time. Okay. So peak to me D is PIC. Yes. Those little red dots are the rings on the way in and the rings on the way out. Ah, okay. The dotted line is the sun. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, okay. So the this tells you that from peak to D, you can begin observing a little below 30 degrees above the horizon. Mm -hmm. From India, it's almost overhead in Kabulur. From the AAT, it's setting. Yes. So this gives you a contextualization of where else on the earth, what your observing circumstances are. And then if you zoom out yeah. and go down to the bottom table, uh -huh. It gives you detailed predictions of when each of the individual uh, ring events will occur. It's awesome. Uh, how fast the event is. Now, I wouldn't trust this to the nearest millisecond, sure. but it gives you at least it's a awesome. sense of what the separation in time would be, um, what the altitude of the sun is and the altitude of the planet, the radius of the ring with the latest orbit models. Oh. how fast the star is moving across the ring plane that's r dot and then the little b question mark in the top says is this ring blocked by the planet 
oh. which for Neptune could happen, but for Uranus, since it's mostly open, Got it. there's no. nothing underneath. Right. So all of those things are available in the online material. Uh, awesome. We will be, if of ephemerities of the objects change or star positions change or catalogs improve. Um, we're committed to updating those and supplying a new version so that uh, as long as um, we have the opportunity, we can keep all of the predictions up to date. That is so cool. This is incredibly detailed. It's literally lovely. Very, very nice. Okay. That will do for now. Good. Okay, very cool. Richard, uh, oh, Tanya, you wanna say something? Yeah, if I may add something. Uh, so this in this paper, we talk about Earth-based occultations only. Ah. But only, I'm, emphasis on only, but there are there are possibilities of doing space-based occultations from telescopes such as James Webb or, or other space missions. For example, we've seen in the, over the past couple of years, there were successful occultations done by space, predicted from space, predicted and observed. Example, an occultation by trans-Neptunian object called Quawar, which was observed from Cheops, which is European mission. Yes. Another yeah. recent observation, ob uh, occultation, sorry, observed by James Webb. And right now, at the moment, we, we are this, we are, we have been, since the publication of this paper, we've been exchanging with the uh, French colleague whose name is Pierre Brossard, who is actually a member of the Ariel mission, the Ariel science team, which is an, yet another exoplanet mission. So basically a mission that is dedicated to characterizing exoplanets um, through their transits. And the principle of occultation is basically the same as transit. It's just yeah. the, in transit, the star and the planet are in the same system. In occultation, we have the object in our system and the star is in, in the other one. So basically the idea is to plan occultations to be observed by Ariel. And that's something that's going to be discussed over the week um, at the um, at ESA, uh, when they, as they are having right now this week, uh, their Ariel science team meeting. So oh. hopefully they will accept the project and we'll be able to observe some yeah. Very nice Uranus occupation support. Again, Uranus orbiter and probe. Very cool. I'll keep my fingers crossed on that one. Very nice. Very cool. Richard, Damia, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this very awesome article. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Francis, for, for this chance. Sure. And of course, it's sort of inherent in, in the article when you say, you know, you're going from 2023 to 2050 or whatever it may be, right? There's an inherent futureness to it. Um, and you mentioned it a couple of times. You mentioned JWST and, and other stuff. But I just want to just want to push on a little bit. Um, you know, where, where do you think we go from here, given the published article? Uh, is there additional observations people can plan? Is there additional theoretical work that can be done? Um, just sort of next steps. I don't want people to think this is the final occultation paper ever on these objects. Um, so just sort of where, where do we go? Next steps. I, I guess I would say that from, for, uh, once we let people know about this paper, we, we got contacted by several different kinds of people, people from observatories saying, what, what's best to observe for the next five years? So we've illustrated how that can be done. We got contacted by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory saying, we're interested in improving the ephemerities of the moons and planets. Um, how can we do that? In fact, from this exercise of making these predictions and also archiving all of the Uranus ground-based occultation data for the last 40 years, which has been a big project for me, mm -hmm. we discovered that there was a there were systematic drift in the Uranus ephemeris uh, over time. Okay. So we've been collaborating with Bob Jacobson at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to improve the planetary ephemeris for Uranus, which had drifted by in the sky by thousands of kilometers over decades. So, oh, wow. um, okay. so um, and then for those who are interested in understanding the uh, deep atmospheres of the moons, 
um, getting a sense for whether the data sets they have in hand are likely to be augmented in the next year or two. And so perhaps they should hold off on that great paper, or maybe this is a good time to write something up. Um, I think yeah. in terms of, of uh, predictions, we're using open source software uh, so people can check our results. Um, and uh, we're, it, I have to say that uh, I didn't think this was gonna be as hard and arduous an effort as it was. And in fact, uh, one of the reviewers, uh, it was one of those situations some of you listeners may have where a reviewer didn't like your paper, but also spent so much time analyzing it that they really improved the results of the paper. So yeah. our, our, our response to the referee was, thank you so much for reading it with such care we clearly haven't done a satisfactory job of explaining why this is essential, why it's hard to do on your own, and why this is of value. So um, I think um, even getting a, criti a very critical review can be uh, sometimes, uh, once you get over your ego shock, um, somebody put a lot of effort into trying to help you improve what you've written. And so this is a particular instance where um, the detailed reviews made a big difference in um, the way we wrote the paper. Right. And I just want to reiterate that point that the uh, goal of the peer review process, people, is to improve a manuscript and arrive at publication. And sometimes the way to that improvement is a critical report. So thank you. Perfect. <laughs> All righty. And Dame, you want to end, end, up, end, on, end off anything with the future here? Yeah. So... Obviously, I personally intend on chasing every single opportunity there is for occupation. Cool. Uh, for both Uranus, Neptune, but also for the satellite, Triton, Titan, actually every single one, but in particular for Uranus and Neptune, because we only got one mission to these two planets so far. Exactly. That's Voyager 2. And it was in 86 and 89, respectively. Therefore, it's about time. And we should take advantage of every single opportunity we get in terms of occupation. And as you've seen, it's rare. It's rare. So 2030s are around the corner. So we're going to chase Uranus occupations. But the other thing I want to mention is about the instrumentation. And that's something very important. Well, I'm not going to, to go into making instrumentation, as you just suggested earlier. But um, it's more... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying never, but still, uh, I just want to make, I, I just want to make it clear to the community that if someone is developing an infrared camera and a fast infrared camera, then there is a science case here where the camera can be tested and we can collaborate. Yeah. And we are also reaching out to the OPAG, so the Outer Planet Assessment Group, mm -hmm. um, for cool. help in order to, to explain to the big infrastructure that are the big telescopes that how important it is to invest in fast infrared cameras. Right. Because some of them are very, very slow. You get one image every 30 seconds. That's not that good. You need few frames per second, few hundred frames per second. Real time. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we're, go we're going to keep on doing that. and. Again, observations, you take those constraints and you work on the dynamical models. And that's the point of making observations and theory work together. Brilliant. That was great. Super. Richard, Damia, I want to thank you so much again for walking us through your very lovely paper. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your occultation astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye bye. Right.